if you depend on organic traffic right now for the livelihood of your business, I'm going to say something extreme that you can edit out. You're fucked. This is the Inbound Forecast, a podcast series about inbound marketing and organic growth for B2B companies. Here's your host, Gerald Arcus. Good morning, Isar. Good afternoon to you. Thank you. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome. I had a very productive week. I'm going to be traveling and taking some time off with the family next week. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a happy camper right now. That's great. <laughs> Last day of the year for you or to work? Uh, is, is there such a thing? Yeah. Kind of, sort of, like a last full day for, for the year. Yeah, maybe for the listeners, we should also mention the date because when you are talking about AI, that's always uh, true. Important. It's true. the twenty second of uh, of December. Yeah, uh, and we are talking today about AI in, I think, mostly in B two B marketing. Yeah. So I think a nice topic, something you can uh, share a lot of information about. I think. You have your own podcast about uh, AI, so uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, before we start, I want to thank Play Forward, the video agency who's creating the vertical videos for my show. Um, and maybe you can start with an introduction of yourself and uh, share one thing that most people don't know about you. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm a pretty open yeah, that's book. A, that, I've been, that's been a hard one for content about myself for a few good years. I think most people know a lot of things about me, but I will try. Uh, I will start with a little bit of a background. I started, my first career was being an F-16 pilot in the Israeli Air Force. I, that's from impressive. There, from there, yeah, <laughs> that's unique, but a lot of people know that already. Uh, I transitioned from that to a small tech startup in Israel that did training and simulation software. And with that company, a small leadership team from that company moved to the US. So this is how I end up in uh, Orlando, Florida, which is where I'm based since. That was almost 20 years ago. So I've been with that company in multiple leadership positions for uh, just over 10 years. That company went public. I left that company and started my own tech startup uh, that was trying to uh, trying to change the affiliate marketing industry with a new kind of technology. I've raised a fair amount of money, had a good team and an interesting product, but we couldn't get it to deliver what we wanted from a return perspective and we shut it down. But very early in that process, my main investor, who was the owner and the founder of a large wholesale travel company, uh, said, listen, you're a smart guy. You obviously know about this tech stuff. Uh, we have a huge company, but we have no e-commerce platform. Why won't you come in and help us develop an e-commerce platform? And I said, well, you know, you're paying me to run this other thing. And we're in the early stages like, well, you're smart. You'll figure it out. I didn't. <laughs> but the, the travel e-commerce platform that we built grew to uh, almost 100 million, not, not almost, over $100 million in sales in a few years. While the bigger company, the company he owned, uh, grew to over a billion dollar in sales. And then we sold the business to a large private equity, went through a huge merger with our two largest international competitors at the time. And so it was a very interesting process involving any consulting company you can imagine on the planet and a few you can't even imagine. Uh, it was a very long and, and not so fun process. And I, I did not like the outcome, the atmosphere. Like I, I had my own little startup with a bunch of incredible people who had an amazing team and we could do this and snap our fingers and change direction and do whatever we wanted. And I got a very fancy title and a nice salary and a lot of people to manage, but I was, everything was really, really slow. The whole corporate structure was a mess and I just didn't like it and I left. I started a company that helped businesses grow through community building leveraging podcasts and live talk shows. So wow. I've done that for two or three years. And then I left that business, sold my half of the business to my partner in October of last year. And then ChatGPT came out <laughs> and <laughs> Good very quickly people, hey, you know, can you help me with this? I'm a geek. I love tech. I have an experience of running and growing businesses. So a lot of people came to me for advice. One thing led to the other. Now I have an AI consulting agency. So I teach courses uh, either private to businesses and organizations or out in the public. 
uh, shameless plug, the next one is happening on January 15th. So if everybody wants, uh, we can talk about this later. You tell me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can share it. Uh, so yeah, so you can share it in the show notes. Uh, it's an amazing course. It's like four sessions, but uh, I courses is one thing I do. I consult to businesses. I actually help them figure out what they need and how to implement AI in their business to make it the most efficient for their business. And I help businesses develop AI-based software solutions because my background is running software companies for 20 years. And so that's another thing that I'm doing. So that's me in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, very interesting and impressive. Thank you. Good CV. Um, um, let's see where to start. A lot, uh, <laughs> a lot to talk about. Maybe you can, um, because I think your customers are not only B2B, right? It's e-commerce. It's a lot of different company types. Uh, actually, most of them, if not all of them, are B2B. All of them are B2B companies. Ah, that's great. That's great because my, my audience is also. Um, can you share some uh, interesting use cases of AI? So what are the most important ones that you see for a lot of companies? So I would say, and I'll focus on the marketing side because it's really even just on the marketing side, looking at use cases for AI, we can probably spend two days talking about this without stopping. Yeah. And we have one hour and I'm sure we want to talk about other things, but I will mention a few. I think the big mistake that many people do, especially on the marketing side, they jump into the content production. And like, oh, yeah. this can help us generate images and it can help us write blog posts and it can help us write snippets for social media. And, it can, and yes, it can do all these things, but... I'm I guilty see, too. <laughs> I see that as, no, no, I, I, I do that as well. But I think there's so many other things, many of them more important that you can do with it that will get you a lot more value from a strategic perspective than just creating the content. And so the first thing, it's an amazing, incredible ideation tool. And when I say ideation, it's ideation on all different levels of your process, even ideating on strategy. Like we want to launch this new product. We want to launch this new service. Our competition is doing this and that. The market has shifted because of AI or because of anything else, like whatever the reason may be. What are ideas? Here's the type of customers we have. Here's who is our competition. Here is our website. Here is the products we're currently selling. Here's the product we want to launch. How can we launch it in the most successful way? What might be the pros and cons? How should we, like literally ideating on strategy yeah. is an incredibly powerful capability that did not exist before. Now, if you want to do it even more specific, and that's something I really, really love about AI, is it will do whatever you tell it, and the more specific you make it, the more specific the results will become. So if there are specific books you really like by specific authors that you want to model your approach to them, literally tell it. I want you to answer only based on Jim Collins' good to great. I want you to answer only based on uh, whatever book or author or speaker that is out there that created a lot of content that you want to model this after, it will do it. So now you can have a strategic conversation with some of the top thinkers in the world in a specific field that otherwise, A, you will never have access to, but even if you did, you probably couldn't afford them. And now you can do this. And so ideating on strategy, ideating on new content, ideating on new procedures that might like anything you want to have a brainstorming session with, but you don't necessarily have these people in the company or you have them, but they're busy not having two hours a day to talk to you. Uh, that's a great way to do this. So ideation and strategy is one. The second I one like it. is data analysis. It's an incredible data analysis tool. Like I, again, used to run a $100 million travel company. I had a data scientist team. I had, I was spending a lot of money on tools and databases and people. And now I can do most of the stuff I could do back then in minutes within ChatGPT. And, and then it, you mean with, by uploading an Excel document for example? Correct. So Excel documents, PDFs, access to data, whatever data you have. So today, almost every platform you have gives you data. You can export it to CSV for almost any platform. You can upload that to ChatGPT and magic happens if you know how to use this tool properly in order to do data analysis. It understands how co to connect dots that is impossible for us to even see. And 
it's really an extremely powerful data analysis tool. And at the end of the day, good marketing is 70% understanding the data. And part of the problem that we have, and I'll say two things. One is that we have too much data, meaning we became so addicted as marketers to data that yep. we have 50 dashboards. And I'm like, okay, now which one do I actually look at and what's more important than what? And so knowing how to make sense in all that data is something that AI knows how to do very, very well, better than we do. So that, Quick question about that. Yeah. Do you prepare your documents before you give them to ChatGPT, for example? So, uh, or, or do you just export, for example, LinkedIn data or from different platforms, just give it and they understand it? Both. So it really depends what you're trying to do, right? Uh, I'll say something that, that blows me away every time I do it, and I do it a lot for my clients and for myself. If you load two sets of data that are completely siloed and independent of one another, and you tell it, okay, I need you to find a way to connect it to it, it will say, oh, they both have email addresses. It, it will do it on its own. They both have email addresses, and I see a lot of overlapping email addresses. Can I assume that this is a unique identifier where I connect the two points of data. You say, yes, boom, now it's all connected. <laughs> so you, don't, you don't have to worry about doing VLOOKUPs and all the other Excel magic that you can do in order to connect different. Now, sometimes there's too much crap in that data that's just mess that's not going to help you, and then I would clean it up before I upload it. But in most cases, it knows how to figure it out, uh, in most cases. So... So data analysis is, is, oh, so I said two things. I said one was you have too much data and then this can help you. But the other thing is all 99% of marketing platforms, and by the way, any other platform that collects data, collects quantitative data and not qualitative data. Yep. Now we have a lot of qualitative data, but it's very, very hard to analyze qualitative data. Analyzing qualitative data requires people to read. So let's say customer reviews. Okay, if you're a B2B company, you have multiple customer reviews. Like, okay, what is good or bad about our service, about our product, about uh, how we progressed in this past year investing in these? Uh, how do people comment on our social media posts? Yep. The only way to do this is to have some kind of a structure that will help people, humans, to put things in different buckets based on things that people say, which just is a huge amount of time. Now, you can do qualitative data analysis with AI with a snap of a finger. You can yeah, take all I your like customer it. reviews, thousands of them, load them into ChatGPT or tools like it and say, hey, what are the most common positive things that people are saying? And it will tell you because it's not keyword based, it actually understands what people are saying. What are the most common negative things that people are saying? Yeah. You can take it to the next level if you uploaded it all in an Excel file and people have responded, you say, okay, I want you to write a personalized feedback message to every person that wrote a negative review. Here are the guidelines and it will write it to you and it will put it in that Excel file then you can automate that through Zapier or Make or NA10 or whatever your tool of choice is to send them back personalized messages. Thank you for highlighting this and that for us. We'll be working like whatever. So beyond the data analysis, you can now take actions based on this data with AI. Do you use that a lot? Uh, tools like Zapier to uh, take action based on AI, AI output? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I now fell in love a few months ago with a tool called NA10, N, the number eight, and then another N, dot com. It's kind of like Zapier. It's way more advanced. So you need to be more technical than you are to use Zapier. But if you have a decent sized company, you have people figure it out. Yep. It allows you to do a lot more than Zapier allows you to do. And it's open source. So you can either pay them for their hosting, which then costs whatever, 20, 30, 40 bucks a month. Uh, you're not paying per zap, you're paying for whatever, but you can also host it on your servers and then it costs you zero dollars. So in my previous company, I ended up paying Zapier two to three thousand dollars a month, depending on the month, depending on the stuff we're running, because we're running a lot of zaps. And now I'm like, 
holy crap, I can do all of this for free. Well, not for free. I'm hosting it on a server. It costs yeah, me five, but... bucks, five bucks a month, right? So, <laughs> so it's free. And so connecting an input from any source, like a marketing platform, email that's coming in, uh, yeah. customer service tickets, like whatever you want, loading that with specific pre-prompts to ChatGPT, Anthropic, whatever thing that you have an API for, using that output, connecting it back to whatever other platform to take an action is something you can do with all these automation tools today. And you mentioned a few others. Uh, we talk about ChatGPT now a lot, but is ChatGPT your standard approach or, or tool, large language model, or do you use, for example, Claude or, or other ones as well? So I use a lot of them and I use them for different use cases. Uh, there's some things I like Claude better than I like ChatGPT. Uh, as an example, summarization, I feel that Claude does better than ChatGPT. So a lot of summarization that I do, including even writing uh, show notes for the podcast based on the long form podcast, I do that with Claude. I find it to be Me too. <laughs> more precise and accurate than ChatGPT that goes more artistic on me, which is not my style when I write show notes. So yeah. there's there's different things. I use different tools. I use Perplexity a lot for research. When I like, I, I very rarely use Google now. I just go to Perplexity and do stuff over there. So there's I, I use different tools for different things, <laughs> and, yeah. and I also use specialized tools for even more specific things, like you know, browsing stuff online and doing research and writing in a specific style. But if I had to put it in percentages, um, more than fifty percent is ChatGPT. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I think in the Netherlands, for a lot of people, it's more because uh, we can't use Claude, we can't use Gemini at the moment. Mm. So um, <laughs> we are a bit behind here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I hate it, but uh, yeah, that's because of the uh, AI Act that we uh, will have in a few years. In a year, they said twenty early 2025. That's the... That's yeah, I'm not sure. The recent I, I heard different things, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, let's see. I, I hope that this makes it easier for, uh, for example, Gemini and yeah. Claude to come to the Netherlands because now it's hard. You, you have to use VPNs and yeah. other more complicated approaches to uh, to get access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I do you want me to continue with? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I like yeah, this. So I have, I have continue. More. Like I, I told you, we can go three days. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that I really like that is not content creation. And again, we'll get to content creation, but a lot of things, another thing that I really like is comparison. It's very good at comparing things. So as an example, you have two variations of a landing page and it's more complex than just an A-B test. Like it's a different format and it's a different this and it's a different that. Or you want to compare your landing page to your competitor's landing page. Yep. You can literally take a screenshot of the full screen, like not just one screen, but you know, you, you can take a screenshot of the full scroll and say, okay, I want to compare this landing page to this landing page. I want you to tell me what's good and bad about it. Here's the type of customer that I'm trying to approach. Here's the kind of pain points that they have. Uh, and to be fair, you can even go beyond that. I said, here's the kind of client I'm trying to approach. What are most likely the questions they're going to ask and the pain points they're going to have? So this goes and back. That's an interesting one because you are using the deficient feature of uh, ChatGPT then. And I did this too, but then more text-based. So compared to URLs from, for example, an SEO point of view, but of course you can also compare the design and more the, the from a UX perspective. Yeah, so I do both. And I, I also give it the URL, but I also let it look at it, uh, the image, and then it has the full design and, and the text. And it gives very, very good advice on what's good and bad, what are the pros and cons. And again, if you started the chat with, who is the target audience? Who are you trying to approach? What are you trying to achieve with this landing page? And then you let it tell you what it thinks, the questions people are going to ask, what are going to be the showstoppers that are going to prevent them from buying? Uh, what are the pain points they're trying to address? All these things it can tell you. And then you go into, okay, now here are two landing pages. Tell me which one you think it's is better. Tell me how you would upgrade each and every one of them to achieve better results based on what we've already found. It's magic and it's stuff that used to take a team of several different people brainstorming sessions and attempts and back and forth and now you can do it in seconds yeah for example i did this but then the based on the url 
and then just gave it, I think, eight URLs that were ranking above my customers page. And also ask it to, to give the, the output in a specific format. So I think prioritize it based on uh, how important it is. Mention which competitors are doing which things better and things like that. And yeah, it's, it's great because it used to take me hours to analyze that manually and get all the insights and create an advice. And yeah, I yeah. really like it. And I agree with you 100%. Like uh, SEO is a huge, huge one when you come to... Oh, it's true for everything in marketing, right? And I'll say that. It's true from the research phase to the ideation, strategy, content brainstorming, content creation, and then data analysis after you do the thing. In each and every one of those steps, in every aspect of marketing, I've recorded a very, very interesting episode, just another idea. Uh, called From Weeks to Minutes. It was episode 31 of the podcast. The podcast is called Leveraging AI, shameless plug. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> episode 31 was about how do you plan and produce local events for potential clients, which is something that used to take weeks, literally, like going through everything in order to create an event. And I've done this with Ashley Gross. She does this for a large B2B SaaS company. And she now does it in a day. So, and we, we went through her entire process, literally everything A to Z, the prompt she's using, the tools she's using, how she's doing it in an hour. So it's, it's mind blowing, right? It's a process that used to take yeah. weeks to a group of people. Can, a person can now do in one day. And events are and huge as far as the value they provide. And again, you don't do a lot of them because just the preparation will stall half your marketing team for a week, which is not something you can do. But if, if one person can do it in a day, now you can do an event once every other week if you have the budget to do it. Yep. So but, um, I hear some people say on LinkedIn, for example, uh, things like AI is nothing more than just a productivity tool. Uh, I think productivity is one, it's a very important one, but you also mentioned ideation. Do you think there are more categories? Uh, yes, like I said, I, I think, listen, I think AI is- Data analysis. Is a mix of an intern and an expert on any <laughs> aspect of business. And the reason I'm saying it's a mix of an intern and an expert from a knowledge perspective, it's an expert. It knows more than most people on most topics. Yeah, so and I think even senior people, because I I think a lot about B2B marketing. And a, a few months ago, I had this idea of merging two different marketing models. And I was asking myself, can you merge these models? And I just gave them to uh, ChatGPT. Uh, they just launched the, the vision feature. and. I got my answer and it was correct because I can uh, judge it if it's correct because of my experience. But um, yeah, I was stuck in my um, way of thinking and it, it helped me a lot. So even for, for senior people in a specific yeah. field, it can help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I think the, the, the most amazing thing about it is the ideation and brainstorming capability on anything. But when I say an intern, it's you got to tell it exactly what to do. <laughs> and then you got to follow up and make sure it did exactly what it needs to do. And then you're going to keep on guiding it until it actually does it. And I think that's where people get it wrong. Like, especially people getting started, they try one or two things, they get a eh, kind of like a mediocre minus answer. And like, well, this is bullshit. Like, I don't understand what the hype. This was a waste of time. And they leave it. Versus yeah, understanding right. that if you just hired a brilliant intern to your business, you will give them more than five minutes and one trial to figure stuff out. And so you will guide them through things. You will try to educate them. You will try to help them understand so they can provide you better outcome. And it's exactly the same thing here. So it's a very capable, powerful system, but you got to treat it as if it's a new intern that you have to walk them through different steps and understanding your business and understanding the goals and understanding what you're trying to achieve. And then you'll get incredible results. So I think we touched on a lot of things. There's obviously at the end content creation. Yes, it knows how to 
create bullet points for content. It knows how to write the actual content. It knows how to write based on your tone. If you explain to it what your tone is, it knows how to create incredible images. Like I stopped my subscriptions and I recommend the same thing to all my clients, to all the photo, stock photo uh, databases, because I can create better images that are exactly what I want for exactly the thing I need, whether it's a post on social media, uh, my website, blog post, whatever the case may be. I create my own images. I do it faster, 95% of the cases. Sometimes I get stuck yeah. because I'm an idiot. On, <laughs> And it's a unique image that speaks to exactly what I want. And not 10,000 other blog posts have the same freaking image. So I win across every aspect of images uh, because I use these tools versus get a stock photo. So there's multiple aspects of content creation. And now you can do video and you can do audio and you can do lectures and presentations and uh, training video, like literally anything you can imagine, you can create with these tools extremely efficiently. Do you um, have a lot of cases where you don't get the output that you want? So, for example, the, the example with images, um, I played a lot with uh, Midjourney, also with Dali Free. Um, in the past with Midjourney, sometimes I wanted something very specific and then it was hard. Uh, but now the new version is out. I haven't tested it yet. Uh, what I see online is very impressive, very beautiful, but sometimes... I just come to the conclusion for this use case, I can better still use a stock photo or find something online. Uh, and I have the same thing for text, uh, to be honest. So um, a few weeks ago, I created a GPT that could create LinkedIn posts based on an article I gave it. And it was very hard. So an example is I told it that um, it could use two sentences and then there should be an enter. And um, it didn't, didn't listen to that. And I tried to edit in a lot of different forms. I couldn't make it work. And then I uh, went to Claude. Um, the GPT had uh, one and a half page of input, tone of voice, everything. I gave Claude nothing and it was correct in the first attempt. And that's sometimes a bit frustrating. I agree. Listen, I, I, I will say a few things about what you said. First of all, I agree with everything you're saying, right? It's sometimes you're like, what's so not... What's so complicated in what I asked you to do? It's like, it's very <laughs> clear. Uh, yeah. That being said, I think it's worth the effort from several different reasons. I agree One with that. is that it's a very, very new field. Nobody knows. Like, it's not just you're getting stuck with that thing. A lot of people are getting stuck. But if you figure it out, now again, in the context of leadership in a marketing department in a large business, if you figure it out, now, every single person in your department, potentially in the company, can use the thing you figured out. Yeah. So, yes, maybe it's frustrating. And yes, I thought it's going to take me 10 minutes and it took me an hour that I didn't have to invest in it. <laughs> but now that hour is going to save an hour a week for three different people in my department. It's a no-brainer, yeah. right? So, yeah, yes, I don't spend an hour on a stupid experiment that is not helpful. But if it's something that is really, like you said, okay, it's going to generate LinkedIn posts that I need to post daily, and it's going to help me do that much faster. And you do this every single day. And now it's going to save you that time every single day. Invest a day in figure it out. Why? Because within two weeks, you got positive ROI on that. And then the rest of the year, you don't have to worry about it. So, yeah, and I have two, two more thoughts about it because you can also think like, all right, from the 10 things that I try, eight of them work and then still I save a lot of time. So that's okay. Yeah. And the other one is for the two that I can do right now, probably I can do it in six months from now. Yeah. And then I already have the experience of yeah. how it works and what I should do. Absolutely. I agree 100%. It's, it's a lot of it is about experimentation to understand how these tools work and how they don't work. So whenever things change, when new tools come out, you already have the frameworks and the understanding in your head to be a lot better than a new person just walking into this tool, even if the tool is better. Yeah. Maybe a, a totally different question. Um, how do you think AI will impact the B2B buyer journey? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I think everybody's buyer journey, right? B2B and B2C are going to be highly impacted yeah. by AI. And 
And we can break it down into three different aspects. Aspect number one is B2B marketing in general in the last decade-ish is all based on content marketing, right? Yeah. Uh, HubSpot yeah. with Outbound and then w whatever, but content marketing is the thing that we all learn to love or hate depending <laughs> depending who you are and how <laughs> successful you are. Uh, I think it's going to change. I don't know how it's going to change. I don't think anybody knows how it's going to change. But I think the whole concept of how SEO works today is going to change. Because I personally now find myself doing a lot less Google searches and a lot less whatever platform, AI research, which means I'm not clicking on links or I'm clicking on a lot less links, meaning the people that could have gotten my traffic are not getting it anymore. And I'm an early adapter, fine. But in yeah. two years, that's going to be the norm, which means if you depend on organic traffic right now for the livelihood of your business, I'm going to say something extreme that you can edit out, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. <laughs> you are. Like if, you, if your business depends on organic traffic and you spend the last decade creating a machine that does SEO well, and that might, I don't know, but it might go away in two yeah. years. You don't have a business in two years. The thing that yep. you've built over a decade will evaporate. And I don't say that to scare anybody. I'm just telling you, this might be the reality. And again, nobody knows. The only thing we do know is that the smart search AI-based capabilities are already built into BARD and built into Google. And the things that they reference are not from the first page of Google. Now, will this change? Maybe, <laughs> but maybe not, <laughs> which means if you have worked very, very hard to work your way into the first page, the first three, the top spot on Google on multiple topics, you may lose that. So what do you do? I, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm saying, I, I don't know the answer. I know you have to be very good at research and staying up to date with where this is going and taking very aggressive actions in changing how you're doing what you're doing in order not to lose your business within the next two years so that's all that's all i can say right now yeah and um i think a few days ago there was a research on search engine journal about um the sources that bart is using uh, and a, a part of it is from page one, a part maybe not. Um, they found some correlations with things you can do that might impact that you are mentioned more often in the answers, but there wasn't any data about the CTR. And I think in most cases, I will get the answer from Bart and it's nice that they give me a source, but I'm not going to click it in most cases. Correct. So still, if you are mentioned, it might not mean clicks, and for my own journey, I uh, noticed that for more and more things, I go to TikTok. So for example, if I think I want an AI tool for something I don't know it exists, I go to TikTok. I don't search in Google because I can find better answers. And for some things, I just go to ChatGPT and ask it, uh, for this uh, podcast scenario, do you think this camera would work for me or this microphone or things like that? And that work also works very good. Yeah. Of course, it can hallucinate a little bit sometimes, but you, so you have to be able to judge the answer that you get. So it's it's um, it's TikTok, it's ChatGPT, it's Bart, and then there might be a little part of the the organic blue links below it, and some people might still click on it. But if eighty percent of your clicks are gone, I think that uh, will end a lot of businesses right now. And so, so that's, but that's just one aspect, right? We said customer journey, yeah. so that's just SEO aspect of customer journey. The other aspect is I think how they engage with your company. And again, I think today, if you think about the full customer journey, especially in the B2B business, uh, the transition goes from, you know, it's the no like trust process that goes somewhere between marketing hands off to sales hands off to closing hands off to customer 
management, whatever project management, whatever, depending different businesses call it different things. I think that's going to change dramatically. I think today, today, there are tools that are very good at doing sales calls, actual sales calls outbound with AI. But I heard your podcast about that. It was very impressive. It blew my mind. Now, what we what we shared on the podcast was just one snippet. Like me and the guy on the show, he let me listen to a few calls and like, holy crap, this is insane. Like, think about well, it. Well, that ahead. episode changed my approach for a customer, to be honest. I'm creating an interviewer right now with a colleague and we want to add the call feature and then we can... Uh, interview subject matter experts for content creation or interview customers about their buy, buy a journey uh, with this technique. So it's, it's yeah, mind blowing. So to add on top of that, every communication you do with customers can be highly personalized. Meaning today, if you have a page that talks about something, that page can be a video of a person that will be the best, most suitable person for that specific target audience down to yep. the person level, right? It could be, I'm saying it doesn't have to be personas anymore. It, it can be this person. What do I know about this person? Well, it's a female. She's from South America. She speaks this kind of Spanish. She uh, likes hiking because I know that because I can watch her Facebook uh, images and she uh, is fascinated by whatever, you know, what kind of sports. The landing page can have a video of a other female Spanish person hiking and playing the sport while explaining the things you want to explain about your product and service. That's where we are today. I'm not even talking about what's coming in two years. What I just mentioned is doable right now. Like you yeah, I haven't seen it, but I think the technique is there, right? The tools to do what I just said exist right now. Now, whether you will take the time to figure it out and implement it in your business, that's a whole different story. But yep. they are available today for a very, very small amount of money. So even if you take snippets, small components of it, you're saying, okay, let's start with personas. But let's start with creating videos of a person speaking to the other person, mentioning them by name is available today. Like, hey, Isar. I wanted to share with you something that I found out this morning that I think you will find interesting. And this, again, is available today. And it will be a person, quote unquote, list talking to me, which is not a real person. Yeah, and then you can also, it, it can be a video that is embedded on the page, but it can also be a call with a sales avatar, Yeah, uh, which might be way nicer than talking, typing to a chatbot of course. on a website. Of course. Yeah, interesting. And what do you think about um, with AI, it's very easy to generate a lot of low quality content. Um, so we want, we might want more content from real humans. Uh, do you think that part is changing the buyer journey a lot and maybe also the role of AI to create that experience? Yes. So I'll say something that I say, you know, I, I give a lot of keynote speak speeches in not hold on just one second my dog is yeah. going crazy and she wants to come out and she doesn't know how to open doors so she's <laughs> hold on just a second. no problem before she starts barking in the middle of a sentence <laughs> Yeah. She's like, she's no pushing problem. me with her nose. Like, I want to get out. I'm like, okay, why did you come in? Uh, yeah. Where were we? Uh, the, the, um, low quality content with AI. How oh, yeah, I yeah, change yeah, yeah, the budget? Yeah. Uh, low quality content with AI. But what was the question? Yeah. And then um, uh, people might want more. Uh, human oh, human interaction. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I give a lot of keynote speeches on on events that are not AI based. I'm like the AI guy coming to give AI education and whatever other thing is happening. Yep. And I have a checklist of things that I tell people to do to get better for the AI age. I teach it in my courses as well in more details. But the last thing within that is more and deeper 
human relationships if you're in B2B. And the reason for that is if you think about, I'm sure you've seen the research, the research shows that AI helps a lot more to people who are below par in their execution, in their thinking and so on, and helps less to the people on top. Meaning most companies as a whole will become better at the day-to-day -day things. They'll become better at creating content. They become better at customer service. They'll become better at sales. They'll become better at writing proposals. They'll become better at all these things because the average is going to be significantly higher because yep. AI helps the people who are below par much better. And so what does that mean? It means it will be harder to differentiate because everybody can do the job. If today the span is you have bad companies, below average companies, average companies, above average companies and excellent companies, it's going to be very good companies and excellent companies. That's what you're <laughs> going to get. It will be a lot harder to differentiate yourself because everybody will be able to do most of the stuff pretty damn well. Yep. So the differentiator is going to be human relationships. So it's not just how do you create more human content is how do you very knowingly find ways to develop more human relationships? How do you do that? Create your own events, meet with people. The events could be digital, right? They don't have to be physical events, yeah. but talk to people, talk to your clients, talk to your ecosystem, your suppliers, find ways to provide each other value, go to trade shows, shake hands, meet people publish valuable content on social and ask people to engage with you and engage back. Don't publish it to get the likes, publish it to actually connect with people. I use LinkedIn every single day. I send and receive dozens of personal mess private messages every single day, dozens. And I respond every single day. Why yep. does that circumvents? the algorithm, right? I'm actually communicating with actual people who care about what I do. It's why you are in my podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> he's a, so here's a proof, right? It, it That's how we, uh, how we met. <laughs> so I, I'm a huge believer in what I'm saying. Again, I had a, a company that helped businesses develop communities. So it's, it's, it's in the back of my head as a way of thinking. But I'm, all I'm saying is it's, it's been very important so far. It's going to become a lot more important moving forward and AI can help you with thinking of topics. AI can help you in outreach. AI can help you at least the initial messages, then it can be you. But if you want to connect with 35 people a day, you can find a way to automate the initial messages, personalize using AI. And then once they respond, you jump in and now it's you and you're actually building a relationship. So there's definitely ways to combine these two worlds together. I'll say one more thing because I said trade shows and I said AI and that's a trick that I literally tried in the last trade show, I went as a speaker and one of the big, and, and it's great for B2B marketers, right? So people who are listening to this are gonna love it. One of the biggest problems of trade shows, any trade show, it doesn't matter which one, is the follow-up, right? During the trade show, you're gonna collect 272 business cards <laughs> for each person that has attended. So if you're a company and 10 people attended, now you have 2,700, whatever the number is said, of business cards that you need to figure, and we never have a good system. Like we have those scanners and our scanners in the phone, but how do you take notes? And what, like, it's, it's never perfect. And again, I was a CEO of companies. I've attended, I don't know, hundreds, but definitely dozens of trade shows in my career. It's a mess always. And now I'm like, huh, what if I use the ChatGPT app, take a picture of the business card, ask it to scan it, OCR it and collect the data and then record, hit the record button on the what on the on the ChatGPT app and say, I spoke with Gina. She is the CMO of this and that company. We've talked about one, two, and three. I want you to create that as a message for me later on. And what I did at the end of the day, so I had 25 of those at the end of the first day. At the end of the first day, but you, said, you don't do that in you don't do that in ChatGPT itself, right? Or I did it in the ChatGPT app. Okay, okay. So I took the picture with the ChatGPT app and then I recorded the thing into the ChatGPT app. And at the end of the day, I said, listen, I want you to create a CSV file with all, all the people that I've connected with, first name, last name, la, 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 and what I told you about each and every one of those people. And now yeah. I can upload it to my CRM in one click. 
and it has That's crazy. like holy crap i just found gold like it was so magical because it's something that everybody struggles with that ChatGPT without you know just ChatGPT no other special tools solved for me immediately with zero effort so I like it's, it. it's these little things of of just think out of the box on what problems it can solve and it can probably solve it for you yeah you have a lot of great examples beyond uh just content creation so i really like that um maybe because we don't have a lot of time left but uh, uh how do you look at the future of let's say large language models but also the the battle between is Google coming back with Gemini and uh, versus OpenAI? How do you see that? For maybe I, I said two years before the conversation, but maybe one year or six months will be enough because it's hard to predict, of course. Yeah, uh, I, I don't make any predictions beyond six months. At this point. <laughs> and even then, I'm like, I'm, I'm probably going to get eighty percent of them wrong. I think the direction is clear. I think there's not going to be too many companies doing this just because creating large language models is a huge, huge investment. But yeah. there are enough players out there today, right? Between Cohere, Anthropic, OpenAI, Google, and obviously we cannot not look at all the open source guys. So Mistral in France are doing incredible things. Their model is yeah. out of this world. They literally announced this week that they're going to open source a ChatGPT level model early 2024. So that's not, oh, I'm going to compromise on quality. You get an open source model that is as good as ChatGPT. And looking at the model they have today, I trust them. Like they really have good stuff. So And it's strange, right? Because I think they, they started the company in May or June uh, this year. Um, and I think they also use by far le less data, of, sorry, uh, less energy yeah. um, to create output. So yeah it's so, very impressive you know between them and meta with llama 2 llama 3 whatever whatever's coming out there's a few very very good open source large language models so if you which means you're gonna have as a company probably you know six to ten different models to choose from these are just the big models then you're gonna have a lot more small specialized models that would either be just training of existing models on something very specific or going to be actual small models that do something very, very well. And there's a lot of examples and more and more every single day. So the beauty of all of this, if you think about it, the infrastructure companies, so Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, Microsoft yeah. are giving us access to more and more of these built into the infrastructure. So we'll, I definitely see this as becoming a plug and play from an IT perspective to companies where they can pick and choose different models for different use cases. So not just, oh, we're going to do everything with Gemini. We're going to do everything with Cohere. No, you'll be able to say for these use cases, like, like we said, you and I talked about this, that there's some things that Claude does better than ChatGPT. And there's some things that perplexity does better than the other two. And yeah, there's yeah. some things that, that, that I actually go to Bard because it does it very pretty well. So you'll be able to pick and choose within the business what tools you want to use, but the infrastructure behind the scenes will enable you to do that. Uh, not every person in the business, but from an IT setup perspective, you'll be able to set it up that way that will A, provide you the highest efficiency, but B, will satisfy needs of data privacy, regulations of your industry, and stuff like that. So I definitely see that going this way. As far as the battle between them, I think Google has been nothing but disappointing so far, <laughs> but it's Google. And what I mean by it's Google, they have more resources than everybody else. They have probably the best AI research lab on the planet, meaning the smartest AI scientists and engineers. I think I also a lot of more, more people than OpenAI, right? Yeah, well, by a scale. Uh, yeah. and, and the most important thing, they have more data than anybody else. They have everything they crawled through Google. They have whatever 75% of mobile phones in the world run their operating system. They run YouTube. They run 
like the um, nobody comes close to them when it comes to multimodality data nobody and since multimodality is where the world is going and if you don't know what multimodality means it means it's not a large language model anymore it knows video and audio and chat and music and voice and everything right so like humans like it can, can consume and generate each and every one of those pieces of content and this is where the world is going i don't see how google doesn't win this in the long run like however you play they may mess it up one more six months or whatever they will figure it out and they will figure it out better than anybody else the other reason they will figure it out better than anybody else is because they have the most to lose we talked about search potentially going away right now search is whatever 89 percent of alphabet's <laughs> income in dozens of billions every single quarter and so they're not going to give up on that they will find a way to generate AI that will generate more revenue to them than what search is generating right now. And so, A, they don't have a choice. B, they have all the resources across every type of resource you want more than anybody else. So I don't see them not winning this in the long run. Sometimes I think, sorry, I hear a very, oh, now it's gone. I hear an echo. <laughs> I hear myself two times. But uh, sometimes I think it's the reason why they are behind. They are maybe a little bit afraid to uh, compete with themselves, with their current revenue models. Um, and maybe, so for example, BART will have Gemini uh, Pro, not Ultra, right? Um, yeah, uh, money must be the reason for that. Well, uh, either that, it take a lot of it, it, to me, when, the way I analyze the whole BART slash Gemini thing is, four days, four days before they've announced Gemini, they've announced they're not going to release Gemini until sometime in Q1 of next year, four days. And then four days later, they're like, oh, Gemini is coming out, but we're coming out with three different models. And I think the reason they did it, or one of the reasons, I'm sure there's other reasons, but one of the reasons they did it is I think Ultra, AKA their best model there is, is not ready. And it's not ready, it has to be much better than GPT-4 Turbo. Why? Because OpenAI is working on GPT-5, which will come out sometime in 2024. So they're competing with a GPT model that is a year old. And it's their second attempt, right? They've already tried that in the beginning. And so, they cannot screw it up. They cannot come up with a model that is not going to blow up people's minds. But and so it's, it's not ready yet. What do you do? I said, okay, we're releasing a not our best model <laughs> now. So you guys can see that we're actually doing stuff and changing things. But don't judge us based on this. This is just a preview and a lesser model and what's actually coming out. And my personal analysis, I, I haven't, I'm not quoting anybody. That's what I think that happened. Yeah, but then it is maybe also a little bit strange that uh, they published the data, the, the test data from their best model, and it was not that great. It was a little bit better than GPT-4. Yeah. Um, and this week I saw some data where they compare uh, Gemini Pro to GPT-4, uh, I think. Or no, no, sorry, to the, to the tests. Yeah. And then it performed way below the results that Google yeah. published. So yeah. if that is the case for their best model, it will be below GPT-4. Yeah. By far, so, maybe. Which, which goes back to what I said. I, I, yeah. I don't think they're going to release it before it blows GPT-4 out of the water. And I think what it comes to show is that GPT-4 is really incredible. Like people think it's a small step up from GPT-3.5. It's a whole different universe, and it's it's that rule of diminishing returns, right? We now have several different models around the GPT 3.5 capability, whether open source or closed. Getting to the GPT 4 level is apparently not easy. <laughs> no. Apparently not easy, even to a company like Google, with all their resources working on it for a year, and they can't do it. So. Now, again, you're asking me long term, long term, I think they will have the best models, especially on the multimodality world. Yep. Right now, 
they're still not there, which is uh, somewhat embarrassing to them, I think. But that's <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> yeah. I have um, two, two short questions. Uh, then I have to... Uh, I, I want to talk to you for hours, but I have to pick up my kids from school. <laughs> um, um, one is about the future of knowledge work. Uh, some people, I think, are underestimating what is going to change in the next few years. A lot of people, to be honest, uh, think that. Yeah, what, what do you want to say to these people and how do you look at that? Um, I think there's a tsunami coming. And I think most people and organizations and industries and society is not ready for it. And yes, I still think humans in the loop are required, but I think they're required less and less. And I just look at the things that I'm doing for myself and for my clients, and I see the efficiencies that it's gaining. And you're saying, okay, we're not talking about a 5% efficiency. We're talking about sometimes about an 80% efficiency. We talked about planning events in a day instead of three weeks with four people. That's a 97% efficiency, right? On doing a specific task. Which means if you, let's say the average on knowledge work will be 25%. And, I'm, yep. and I, I think it's going to be more, by the way, in the long run. But let's say it's 25%. There's two options and two options only. Either you're like, oh my God, with these capabilities and by freeing those people from 25% of tasks, I can generate 35% more business or 100% more business. Why? Because now I have capacity, skill, people to do more stuff. Awesome. Then that's the right way to do this. But if you cannot, either because competition is doing the same thing or the market is saturated or whatever the case, it doesn't matter. If you cannot grow your business by at least 25%, the simple solution is to let go of a few people. Cut yep. costs. Because now I can do the same quality and quantity of stuff with 25% less resources. And there's zero doubt in my mind, zero doubt in my mind that we're going into an era where a lot of people that make very nice salaries and have a very nice quality of life right now because of it are going to lose their jobs to this tsunami now yeah. will it generate new jobs absolutely no doubt in my mind it happened in every revolution that happened to mankind the problem is the speed it's happening so if you think about the industrial revolution it's like 150 years well, we had time to figure it out. Think about the agriculture revolution. It's even longer than that. It, we had time. Think about the computer revolution. 30 years. We had like yep. every This happens in weeks, in months. So these new jobs will emerge. They're, again, there's no doubt in my mind. But they will emerge way slower <laughs> than the jobs that are going to be consumed by it. And I, I'm seriously troubled by that like when yep. i think of big things that scare me with ai it's not an ai going rogue and launching nuclear weapons and destroying the planet it's stuff like this it's job loss it's it's that there's no truth anymore we have most of the communication we have whether it's personal communication with people or global communication is digital and there's every single person today Every single person at their house can fake any piece of news, any piece of information, any piece of person. Like I, I have replicated versions of myself that I've created, but anybody can create them. Yeah. And it talks like me and it looks like me and it moves its hand like me and it moves its head like me. And we're in version 1.1. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no truth anymore. Like what is true? How do you know? Unless you meet that person in person in real life and then you talk to them because this the conversation we're having right now six months from now you can have it with an ai that is representing you and you will never know the difference and my wife and kids won't be able to know the difference and that scares me yeah it is and i think i see a lot of linkedin messages about people saying well ai is not taking your job but people who can work with ai and things like that but in most cases it's the people who say it 
who haven't worked with AI, who don't follow AI thought leaders. And a lot of people like you, um, I also listen a lot to the Marketing AI show. Yeah. And uh, people with knowledge about this topic uh, say the same things as what you are saying. So I think it's scary indeed. Yeah. And by the way, it doesn't take anything away from the fact that if you know how to use these tools, you have a much higher chance of keeping your job or finding, yeah, so... or finding a new job that will apply it in a better way. But uh, so, so it's the outcome, the recommendation is still the same recommendation like learn how to use these tools the best way you can because then you're most likely to have a job <laughs> yeah indeed last question uh, if you could go back in time with a time machine 10 years what advice would you give yourself wow 10 years is a long like i've done so many things in the last 10 years um <laughs> uh, i don't know I'm, I'm very comfortable with decisions that i've make that i've made yes, what advice would I give myself? I think being a constant learner is something that I'm applying a lot more in the last four to five years than I've done before. I was, again, running a large company and in a very comfortable situation. So you don't force yourself to learn because you're A, really, really busy and B, yep. in a very comfortable situation. And so I think if I go back that far uh, when I was running the travel company, uh, that would be the number one advice I would give myself is continuously educate yourself across multiple aspects of life. It doesn't have to be business related yeah, uh, because it helps you A, be a fuller person, but B, make better decisions. Great. I really like this uh, conversation. <laughs> I hate here. that we have to end it. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, where can people find or follow you? So I'm most active on LinkedIn. Uh, the, 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 the bad thing about having a name like Isar Metis is that I have to spell it and pronounce it every single time. The good is there's only one Isar Metis on LinkedIn. So if you <laughs> type I S A R M E I T I S on the LinkedIn search, you found me. So that's probably the easiest way I have the leveraging AI podcast. Uh, so if you, if you're listening to this, you're on a podcast platform, just open it and search for leveraging AI. And uh, my website is multiply by spell with AI in the end instead of a Y in the end. So it's kind of like a trick. So multiply spelled with AI dot AI is my website where you can find a lot of resources and tools and systems and the course we talked about and a lot of other and the podcast. So a lot of <laughs> other good stuff if you want to educate yourself about AI, um, relatively easy to find. Great. Uh, again, thanks a lot. No, thank you. I, I really enjoyed myself. It was a great conversation. Great. Thanks for listening to the Inbound Forecast. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app.